here for the first time, if you've not been here in some time, we're in a series from Hebrews chapter 11 uh, entitled simply The Power of Faith in Jesus Christ. The Power of Faith in Jesus Christ. And this morning we're going to see that the power of the faith in Jesus Christ helps us to, to reject some things and to accept other things. The power of faith in Jesus Christ that enables us to reject some things and accept other things. Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptian attempting to do so were drowned. May God just bless me to his word, may it be sanctified in our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word, for the entrance of your word gives light. Now speak a good word to us today. To the end that we might be revived and encouraged and strengthened and rejuvenated, Lord, to live our life with zest and with enthusiasm and joy in Jesus Christ. Open the hearts of men, that woman, that boy or girls never come to faith to Christ today. That they might yield. What must I do to be saved? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The power of faith in Jesus Christ that enables us to reject some things and to accept other things. In this text in Hebrews chapter 11, we shared with you several weeks ago that the writer of Hebrews is writing primarily to a Jewish Christian audience that come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, they were struggling in their faith because they were being persecuted. Life was very hard and difficult for them. Uh, some of them had lost their material possessions. Their homes had been foreclosed on. Their possessions had been repossessed. Their families had ostracized them. And they wondered whether or not faith in Jesus Christ was the real deal. Or should they return back to their old ways in the Jewish religion? The Jewish religion was a religion of rules, a religion of regulation, a religion of works. It was a religion with a prescription, with a formula, with a recipe. But this new Christian faith required them to live with uncertainty, things that they would not know, and they had to walk by faith. So the writer of Hebrews is trying to strengthen these Jewish Christians' faith. And so what he does to strengthen them he causes them to go back into their, into their history. And he reveals the history of their ancestors with them in a marvelous way so that they could see that the people they loved the most, that they respected the most, that they revered the most, were people who had lived with uncertainty and with doubt and with great question marks. The only certainty they had was their faith in the living God. And that's why it's so important for us to revisit our history, to see what our ancestors, our foreparents, had to endure without certainty, not knowing exactly what the outcome was going to be, and sometimes not experiencing the benefit in their own lifetime, but telescopically looking through the corridors of time and to believe that things would be better for their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, etc that things would constantly improve until the Lord returned. And they lived, they lived by, by faith. So the writer of Hebrews is going back into antiquity. He's going back into history, and he resurrects these people before them. And we saw in our first study where he lifts up a man by the name of Abel. And he says, by faith, Abel offered up a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, and by it, he received a witness or a testimony that he was righteous. 
So Abel worshiped God by faith, offering to him the best that he had to offer. And Abel's ungodly brother Cain was envious of Cain, of Abel. He slew Abel, he killed him, and Abel's blood was poured out on the earth. But the Bible says that the blood of righteous Abel, it cried out from the ground until it got God's attention. This past week, I've embarked on a little project with some people about the, the Hulse, Hawk's Nest Tunnel project. Remember the old Hawk's Nest Tunnel? You used to have to go through the Hawk's Nest Tunnel as you were going up uh, the, the turnpike. It's closed down and shut down now. What most people don't know that the Hawk's Nest Tunnel was built back in the 1920s. At the time it was built, uh, Union Carbide Corporation owned it, and they will admit that 785 men died. They admit to that 785 men died as they were building that tunnel. And there are some estimates there were 2,000 that died. Many of them had migrated to West Virginia from the south to work. And they died in that tunnel. Some of them died in a matter of weeks, others in a matter of months, others lingered on for a longer period of time because they were exposed to silica. And silica causes one to develop silicosis. And what happens with silicosis is the silica is very, very fine. It gets in the lungs and it hardens the lungs and you literally suffocate from silicosis. They knew that silica was dangerous. They knew that it was deadly, but they put those people in that mine anyway, in that mountain. And many of them died. They didn't even contact their families, and there are still unmarked graves up in Fed County to this day of the, some of these men who died. But now, their bones are crying out from the ground. And someone has heard this story, and a lady is doing a documentary on this story. So this story will indeed be told. And this goes one of the move, most moving documentaries you've ever seen. And as a matter of fact, it was the result of this tragic situation that resulted in many of the work safety laws that was passed in the United States in the 1930s. And so even though these men died and their story has not been told, their lives still cry out that people at least know the sacrifice that they made. Abel's righteous blood cried out from the ground and God had to avenge him. God always has to avenge the righteous. And that's why God will have to return and judge the world by Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ's righteous blood was poured out at the hands of evil and wicked men and God will return and he will judge the world for the death of his son Jesus Christ. So we talked about righteous Abel. And then the writer of Hebrews, he goes on to talk about a man by the name of Enoch, and we don't know a whole lot about him. It's just simply that he walked with God. And he had a witness that his life pleased God, and one day he went to take a walk with God, and he just walked right on into heaven. Only one of two men in the Bible where there's a record that did not taste death. Elijah was the second, Enoch was the first. God translated them, and they were no more. No tomb. No graveyard, no headstone, their lives so pleased God that he declared that the world is not worthy of this righteous person. And so they were translated. He walked with God. And he tells the story of Noah, this great patriarch. And Noah, for 120 years, built an ark. And during the time he was building that ark, he testified and he preached, it's going to rain, judgment is coming. And the Bible says Noah worked for God. And because he worked for God, God used the work of Noah's hands, the ark, to save him and to save his three sons, their wives, and Noah's wife. And God used Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, to repopulate the earth after the flood. The power of one man's faith in God resulted in the salvation of the human race. He goes on to talk about a man by the name of Abram, or Abraham, and we know him as the father of the faithful. And Abraham was justified by God, declared righteous because he believed what God said, even though he didn't have an heir or a son, but he believed that God would give him heirs. He would give him a seed and offspring as innumerable as the stars in heaven, as innumerable as the sand of the seashore. He didn't stagger at the promise of God, but he went looking for a city that he didn't know where it was. And by faith, he believed that God would get him in. And then last week, we looked at Isaac and Jacob. And Joseph, these three patriarchs, and the writer of Hebrews talks about the end of their lives, not their exploits during their life,
but they lived by faith, and all three of them came to the end of their lives, and they had, yet net, they had not yet received the promise that God had promised them. But they didn't stagger at the promises of God. And the Bible says that Isaac blessed his two sons, Jacob and Esau, and Jacob blessed his sons, leaning, the sons of Joseph, leaning on a staff when he was on his deathbed. And Joseph, even though he's the most, second most powerful man in Egypt, and you would have thought Joseph would have wanted them to build a monument and a memorial to him in Egypt. Joseph, the prince of Egypt, who saved the nation and the world because of his intellect and because of his skills and his giftedness in planning. But instead, Joseph was on his deathbed. He wrote in his will, and he called his sons to the side of his deathbed. He said, look, God has promised us a land in Canaan that flows with milk and honey. And it, don't, it does not appear that I'm going to see that land. And Joseph says, when I die, and they're going to have an incredible funeral for me, they're going to mummify me, they're going to place me inside a tomb, they're going to give me the burial of a head of state, but don't let my bones stay down here. When y'all leave out here, y'all excavate, y'all hew my bones and take my bones and plant my bones in the rich soil of Canaan. I, I, I tell my wife often, I know they're not going to do it, but I tell them often now, if I, if I leave before y'all do, I, I love Charleston, West Virginia, I love the greater Canoa Valley, but don't, don't bury me down here. Take me back to the mountain where I was born. I will be back on Mount, in Mount Hope, West Virginia, on the mountain, because it's closer to heaven up there. And when the rapture comes, I want to get up first. I want to beat y'all when we meet the Lord. And don't, don't, don't put me down in this valley where I got to climb up through all the chemicals and all the odor. No, no, put me up on the mountain where the air is fresh and crisp and clean. Don't leave my bones down here. Well, he comes down to Moses. And Moses is a, the epitome of how a man's decisions, it shapes his life, a woman's decisions shapes her life. Our lives are nothing more than the sum total of the decisions that we make in real time. Some of them consciously and cognitively, some of them subconsciously because we program to process information a certain way, but at the end of the day, we are a sum total of our decisions. The everyday opportunity to make right decisions is what reflects our Christian maturity. When we make good decisions, it reflects a, a depth of Christian maturity. When you make bad decisions and wrong decisions, it reflects shallow immaturity. Everyday life hinges on the decisions that we make. And I tell young people all the time, there's a law of the unintended consequence. Everybody gets to do whatever they want to do. <laughs> you can do whatever you want to do. You can choose to do whatever you want to do. Now, some decision might cause you to end up in penitentiary. Some decisions might cause you to end with a sexually transmitted disease that's incurable. Some decisions may cause you to have other mental health, but you can do whatever you want to do. We can choose to do whatever we want to do. What we don't get to choose are the consequences. Packaged in every choice are consequences. Some of them are tent intended what we want to happen. Some of them are unintended what we don't want to happen. But in many cases, the unintended consequences are hidden from us. We don't even know they're there. And that's why we want to make decisions by faith based on what God's word teaches us, based on the instruction that we receive from, mature, from spiritual, God-fearing people. So everyday decisions really do matter. So in the scripture, we are exhorted to make right decisions. The exhortation is to make right decisions. In Deuteronomy 30, 19, God says, I called it to reckon against you heaven and earth, the Lord said against the Jewish people. I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Therefore, choose life that, they, that thy seed may live. He didn't say choose life so that you might live. He said choose life so your seed, that your offspring might live. God wants us to make good decisions so that we create a better atmosphere, a better ambiance for our children and our grandchildren. And this may be the first generation that had such preoccupation with self-centered narcissism that we're creating an environment that is dangerous for our children. And for the, for the first time in, on the United States of American soil, our children may not have the quality of life that we've had. We've got to choose life 
so that our seed can live. In Joshua 24, 15, you remember that story. Joshua is an old man. This is the powerful thing about Joshua 24, 15. This was not some young, strong, masculine, virile young man. This was an old man at the end of his life that had fought many battles, many wars, many contests had endured much difficulty. Joshua comes to the end of his life. He says to the Jewish people, he says, if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, then choose this day who you're going to serve. But for, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Joshua said, that is our choice. You choose who you're going to serve. You remember the record in the book of 1 Kings 18.21? The prophet Elijah has had a very difficult time with King Ahab and Jezebel. Jezebel now has a contract out on Elijah's head because he's prophesied in a negative way against her and the king. Elijah calls the people together and he says to them, How long will you be halt? Will you be divided between two opinions? He says, now, If Baal be Baal, then serve Baal. If God is God, then serve God. But you got to choose whether you're going to serve Baal or whether you're going to serve the Lord God, Jehovah. Now, you got to understand this whole idea behind Baal worship, uh, the worship of Baal. Uh, Baal was uh, the goddess. They offered their children to Baal. And Baal and Ashtaroth was also the goddess of sexual pleasure. And so the Jewish people, as they were coming to the promised land, they saw the way the people around them were living. It was enticing. It was inviting. So they decided, we want to eat. We want to drink. We want to be merry. And we want to let it all hang out. And Elijah said, you can do it if you want to. Choose to say who you're going to serve. But you can't serve Baal and say you're serving God. You can't serve Baal with your body and with your mind. And then say, well, I'm going to serve God with my spirit. Elijah said, you can't have that dichotomy, you see. You've got to serve God with the totality of of your being. And so our choices matter. We are exhorted to make right decisions. We looked at some of those examples of those who did make right decisions. Abel, who chose a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Enoch, who walked with God. Noah, who worked for God. Abraham, who was the champion of faith. Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, who lived their lives by faith to the end. Now, there's an enemy of right decisions, and it's temptation. Temptation is always the enemy of right decisions. Temptation wouldn't be so tempting if it didn't look and taste and feel so good. That's what makes it temptation. The enemy is never going to tempt you with something you don't like or with something you don't want, something that doesn't bring you pleasure. The temptation will always be packaged in such a way that appeals to the eye. It appeals to the flesh. It appeals to the ego. That's what John, in 1 John 2, 15 through 7, he says, Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. For any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, it is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abides forever. The enemy of right choices is temptation, the allurement, the enticement. And this is by far the most difficult age in, in history in which to live a righteous life. Because the power of Madison Avenue, with advancements in technology, and as we shared on many occasions before, in the past, the best people could do would, was to do evil and promote it. Then they progressed to being able to draw it, and then they progressed to being able to make a, 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 a picture of it and reproduce it. Now it's digitized. Now it's on the world wide web. It's in cyberspace. Evil and wicked and decadence is everywhere. And no matter what technological advancement we come up with, someone figures out how to use it in a decadent, degrading way. And so the battle is always to how do I make better choices when there are so many bad choices that I can make. Well, let's look at what the Bible says about Moses. Moses was the second greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. He was the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets from Matthew to, to, from Genesis to Malachi. <laughs> but there's one Old Testament prophet in Matthew that eclipses Moses, and that's John the Baptist. 
See, John the Baptist was an Old Testament prophet, even though he appears in the New Testament. Because the New Testament doesn't go into effect until after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So John is a prophet, the last Old Testament prophet in the prophetic line. And Jesus said of John the Baptist, born of woman, there's none greater than John the Baptist. But before the Baptist, Moses was the greatest of all of the Old Testament prophets. And he was greatly revered. Moses' life spans further than any other person's life in the Bible. His life spans from Exodus chapter 2 all the way to Deuteronomy chapter 34. Nobody's life spans that much of the Bible because he was so critical in God's movement. Moses demonstrates that there are some things that we got to reject, and we got to reject them by faith. When everything inside of us is attracted to it, like a magnet to metal, there are some things we have to reject by faith based on what God's Word teaches. Now cast your eyes upon the text in verse 24, and let us investigate it together. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, what in the world is all that about? A little bit of historical spade work, you know that Moses is born in Exodus chapter 2. And when Moses is born in Exodus 2 in Egypt, the Jewish people now are slaves. They came into Egypt as invited guests of Pharaoh because of the love he had for Joseph. But Joseph died, and years passed. There rose another Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph. So he put the Jews into servitude, and he says, let's kill every Jewish male because we want to limit their power to rise up against us in battle. So every child was supposed to be killed, and we'll see that Moses wasn't by his parents. But Moses ended up by the providence of God being raised in Pharaoh's house. And he was raised as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was a crown prince, raised by the daughter of Pharaoh. And so now the Bible says in this abbreviated text in Hebrews 11, 24, by faith when he became of age, well, how old was he? He was 40. So for 40 years, Moses had been raised as being the son of Pharaoh's daughter. For 40 years, he had wore designer clothes. For 40 years, he had ran, drove customized chariots. For 40 years, he had ate the best food that was available in Egypt. For 40 years, people bowed to him when he walked down the street because he was the crown prince. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But the Bible says that in the past of time, it came to Moses that he really wasn't the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And as a matter of fact, I believe he knew that because through God's providence, when his sister Miriam had placed him into the Nile River, Pharaoh's daughter just happened to be bathing there. She just happened to have affection for Moses. She brought Moses into, her, into the palace as her son, but because she was not, had not had a child, she could not nurse him. She sends to get someone to nurse him, and he ends up being nursed by his own mama. And so in the Jewish culture, he might have been nursed until he was five, six, seven years old, maybe even older than that. But during that period of time, his mama had told him, now, you're really not the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Go over there, play the game, go to school, get the education, learn the language, enjoy all the benefits and the privilege, but you're really not the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Because I don't want you to be psychologically and emotionally damaged when someone tells you one day you can't pass no more. Y'all know you know what that means. <laughs> Y'all young folk do know what that means, but the people down in McDowell County, Mercer County, Raleigh County, they know what I'm talking about. No, you can't pass no more because you're not the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Somewhere in the providence of God, Moses saw the affliction of his people. He saw them under the Egyptian slave master's whip. He saw the brutality against them, and something stirred up inside of him. He says, those are my people. Those are my, 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 my ancestors' people. And so you know the story. Moses, he, he defends the Jew against the Egyptian. And Moses literally takes his hands, and he kills the Egyptian who was beating the Jew. And now he got a problem. And so he runs as a fugitive from justice. And he, he no longer wants to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He understands that I am a Jew. I'm not an Egyptian. 
I'm not the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So the Bible says that there are some things you reject. And what do you reject? You reject the world's prestige. There was prestige. There was stature. There was clout with being the crown prince, with being the son of Pharaoh's daughter, with being possibly an heir to the throne. But Moses came to the point to where he rejected the prestige associated with being the son of Pharaoh's daughter. There will come times in some of our lives to where to serve Jesus Christ, to be pleasing to God, and make the decision that God will be pleased with, we will have to reject the world's prestige. We have to stand on our biblical conviction, stand on what we believe to be true, regardless of what the consequence might be. Moses chose that. He knew that he was actually taking his life in his own hand, that Pharaoh would have a contract out on his head, which he did. But he rejected the world's prestige, the Bible says, because he knew that he was called to do something by God that God was now calling him to identify with the struggle of his people, that God was calling him to now to be an advocate for the liberation and for justice for his people. So he made the decision to respond to God's call and to, ju to choose God's way by refusing the honor of the palace and having more respect for the word of God. And let me tell you young people something. There was absolutely nothing wrong with Moses being in Egypt. God had brought him there providentially. There was nothing wrong with him being in the king's palace. God providentially put him in the palace. Nothing wrong with him going to Egyptian school. God providentially had him go to He learned hieroglyphics. He learned science and physics and math. And he learned languages. As a matter of fact, he had the best education that you could get in Egypt. And there was nothing wrong with him getting the best education he could get in Egypt. And there was nothing wrong with him enjoying all the wealth that God had brought him in contact. Nothing at all wrong with that. The problem was that when God told him to give it up, he had to give it up if he was going to be pleasing to God. He had to decide whether or not I'm going to continue to hold on to this which is temporal, which is finite, which is passing. Am I going to seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness? So he rejects the prestige and the privilege that's associated with being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. There are some things we have to reject. The second thing I see in this text is that faith also will cause you to reject the world's pleasure. Not only the world's prestige, but to reject the world's pleasure. Look at the text closely. Verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. And I like what the, new, what the King James says, for a season. You see, so the Bible does not try to lie to us. It does not tell us that sin is not pleasurable. It does not tell us, well, you're not going to enjoy sin. It's not going to make you feel good. No, the truth of the matter is that sin is pleasurable. Sin does bring satisfaction. But the Bible says that Moses chose to reject the pleasure associated with the king's palace and with the king's prestige and to rather to identify with the suffering of the people of God. The suffering of the of people of God. In every generation, People who call on the name of God have to decide, who am I going to identify with? And that's why I'm concerned with Christianity in America, because so many Christians don't want to identify with the church. In the Bible, there's no such thing as a free agent Christian. In the Bible, if you were became a Christian, you were attached with, identified with, and associated with the church in that particular city and the house churches that meet and that convene. There's no such thing as a long range of free agent Christian, me and my Bible, me and the Lord, we don't need nobody else. As much as I love that the gospel music artist, that's a theologically incorrect song. As long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. Yes, you do. As long as you got him, you don't need anybody else to get you to heaven, and you won't need anybody else when you get to heaven. But until you get there, you need somebody else. Because you never know what this life is going to bring you. You might need somebody to bring you a bedpan. 
You might need somebody to bring you a glass of water. You might need somebody to bring you arthritis medicine. You might need somebody. You don't know what this world is going to know. We need each other in a most desperate way. And that's why I preach loyalty among siblings, among children. I said, why wouldn't you be loyal to your own siblings when your mama and your daddy die, when your grandma and your grandpa die, when your aunts and uncles die, all y'all going to have is each other and you have to take care of each other. And with the looks of Social Security and Medicaid and Medicare, we all have to take care of each other. We might have to turn the church into a senior, set up, senior citizen's house to take care of folk. Now, y'all shouldn't laugh. That might be the truth. It might very well be the truth that we go back to the old ways where we are responsible for taking care of the elderly, the infirm, those who cannot care for themselves. He identifies with the affliction of God's people, with the suffering of God's people, with the challenges that confronts God's people, the Bible says. So faith rejects the world's prestige. Faith rejects the world's pleasure. There's something else faith rejects. Faith rejects the world's plenty. Again, verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ of greater riches. Now, you got to get behind the text, that word for esteem. He said he, he, he it occurs the idea of he analyzed it. <laughs> he evaluated it. He thought about it. And he came to the conclusion that the suffering associated with Jesus Christ on the earth is to be valued more than all the wealth and the riches of the earth. Look at the text again. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. <laughs> he said Moses looked at the suffering of God's people and said, I'm better off being identified with God's people in their suffering than I am enjoying the place of Egypt for a season because down the road, God is going to reward those who identify with him and his people in time. So faith rejects the world's plenty. It rejects the world's pleasure. It rejects the world's prestige. There's something else that faith rejects. Verse 27, and I'm almost through. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Now, if you're not careful, you'll stumble all over that. And you speed readers, you'll read right past the theological potency of that text. He says, by faith, Moses, he forsook Egypt, said, I'm not, I don't give a flying flip about the king, about Pharaoh, about his power. He had no fear of Pharaoh because of his faith in God. Once we overcome the fear of death, once we overcome the fear of intimidation, we then become truly free. We become truly liberated. Many Christian people are not liberated because they're, they're still held by the fragile thread of somebody else's opinion of them. Someone else's evaluation, somebody else's assessment of them. They're more concerned about that than they are about what God thinks about them and God's favor that's been bestowed upon them. But the Bible said a man who had everything ended up with nothing and said, I don't care anything about anybody but God. I'm concerned about what God has to say. So he rejects the world's pressure. He rejects the pressure of the world to try to conform him into their mold, into its expectation, you see. He rejects that and says, I will identify with God. I will seek God, whatever the price. Are you following? God helping somebody today. He's helping somebody. You won't admit it, but you know he's helping you. So he rejects the prestige, the pleasure, the plenty, and he rejects the, the, the pressure. You know, if I, if I can just testify just for a minute. Now, I, I know what it is to live with pressure and what it is to live with people trying to intimidate you and to try to get you to back off of your position by offering you something. You'll be amazed at how many jobs I've been offered, how many grants I've been offered if I just wouldn't write about this, if I wouldn't talk about this. They got people to maintain surveillance on my radio program to see what I'm talking about. And since we pay for the bill every week, I talk about what I want to talk about, exactly what I want to talk about, because you have to be free enough to speak to issues in a way that you believe that they need to be addressed. And once you get to the point to where you no longer fear the pressure of the world, 
you have an exhilaration, a sense of freedom, of invincibility to do what God called you to do. And so Moses was way beyond that point. Well, let me wrap this thing up. I don't want to leave you just knowing what faith rejects. You got to know what faith accepts. There are two things that I want to talk about. Well, three things I want to talk about that faith accepts. Faith accepts the Lord's plan. You got to go all the way back to verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, which he had nothing to do with, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. Again, if you're a casual Bible reader, you've missed the point. Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, he had told every midwife, when the Hebrew women go into labor, as soon as the baby comes out of her womb, if you see it is a male child, you snatch it up and you slit his throat. Don't let none of the male children live because we cannot allow them to outpopulate us. They might rise up and revolt against us. But the Bible says in the providence of God that Moses' mama went into labor and she went into labor so fast and delivered so quick that the deliverer didn't have a chance to get there and the baby was born and they hid the baby. And they didn't care nothing about what Pharaoh had said. They said, God had given us this child. This child is a gift of God, not a gift from Pharaoh. So they hid the baby for three months as long as they possibly could because they believed that maybe this child will be used by God to do something for our people. So because they did not fear what the king said, but instead chose to honor God, God honored them by faith. We accept the Lord's plans. We accept the Lord's plans. Secondly, verse 28, by faith we accept the Lord's provision. By faith he kept the Passover. Now Moses is over 80 years old now. He keeps the Passover. It sounds stupid. It sounds silly what God told him to do. God said, look, Moses, you saw the plagues I brought against Egypt. You saw the darkness. You saw the frogs. You saw the water turning to blood. You saw all of these things. Now I'm going to do one more thing. My death angel is going to pass over Egypt. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell every Jewish family to go out and get a little innocent lamb, bring that lamb into their house and cuddle it and nurture it and care for it, and then I want them to betray the lamb, to slack the lamb's throat and let his blood run out and then take his blood and put it on the door and put it on the post. That sounds silly, doesn't it? But why don't we do that? Moses didn't know why he would do that. He didn't know the Passover lamb was a type of Christ. He didn't understand that God was showing them in a type that he would send his lamb, the perfect lamb of God, Jesus Christ, the innocent lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who would be coming to the world. We brutalize, manhandling Maul, would have his blood poured out by savages. But his blood that would be shed would satisfy God's wrath and anger against mankind and those who were under the blood. Help me, Holy Ghost. Moses didn't even know by putting the blood on the post and over the door that symbolized he was under God's protection. So when the death angel passed over, every Hebrew firstborn child died. But in the Jewish household, no children died. Why didn't they die? Because they were under the blood. And one man, Moses, did what God told him to do, something that appeared to be silly and stupid and inconsequential, but he obeyed, obeyed by faith. He accepted the Lord's provision. He said, if the Lord is going to save us by innocent lamb's blood being slain, we're going to trust the innocent lamb's blood. And if I had been Moses, I said, well, Lord, well, where are the bow and the arrows? Lord, where are the catapults? Where are the weapons we're going to use to get up out of here? What is an innocent lamb's blood being slain going to do to help us? What Moses didn't know, that God Death ain't a passed over. That traumatized all of Egypt. The whole nation was in the morning when their children died. Even Pharaoh's firstborn child was dead. The whole nation was traumatized. And the same man Pharaoh said, y'all can't go. He said, y'all can get up and get out of here. 
and he asked them to leave. He accepted the Lord's provision. And then lastly, by faith, we accept the Lord's power. Once they got up out of Egypt, and once Pharaoh realized they had been tricked, what the Jewish women did, they borrowed all this stuff from the Egyptians. They had their silver, they had their china, they had all their stuff. And then when they left, they just took it all with them. And once Pharaoh realized this was all a trick for them to get up out, he changed his mind. And he called his captains together and he said, y'all go and y'all capture them. And y'all kill that Moses. And so the Pharaoh's army heads out of Egypt to go catch these ex-Jews. There's probably two and a half million of them. They sandals, they ain't got no decent clothes. They got raggedy sandals. They got raggedy gowns on and cover. They got head pieces on. Their afros are looking bad. The braids ain't done. Fingernails haven't been did. They in trouble. They look bad. They just raggedy. And they get out of Egypt and they come to the mountain and all of a sudden they hear the thundering and the rolling. It sounds like a storm. It sounds like thunderclap. And they look back and here comes Pharaoh and all of his horsemen and all of his chariots and everything. And the people say, Moses has brought us out here to be slaughtered. We should have stayed as slaves in Egypt. And then Moses looks out and there are the, the mountains on both sides of him. There are Pharaoh's army is coming from behind him, and now the Red Sea is in front of him. And the Moses said, Lord, what are we going to do now? And the Lord says to Moses, Moses, what's that in your hand? Moses had been carrying a staff around in his hand, a walking stick. And he didn't realize in that walking stick, God would anoint it, and God would unleash that power in that walking stick. He said, Moses, what do you have in your hand? And Moses lift up the staff and pointed, and the Bible says that the Red Sea rolled back and created mountains on either side. Are y'all helping me this morning? It was all simply by faith. No magic in no stick, no magic wand, but the power of God from heaven anointed the stick in the hand of the man of God. And he lifted the stick out, and the water spread it, and the Jews, they all passed over as on dry land. There wasn't any no humidity there. They didn't even need their straightening combs to fix up their kitchen. They didn't need no royal crown grease to fix their hair. God called them to go through in an air-conditioned cavern as they crossed over on the other side. And when the Jews, the Egyptians tried to do the same thing, the Bible said the waters collapsed on them and all of them was consumed. They just simply said, we will accept God's power. If you're willing to accept God's power, even when it sounds like he's calling you to do something foolish or stupid, when God shows up, God can take a stupid staff anointed by his Holy Spirit and do great, wonderful, and marvelous things. When we think that our presence don't make a difference, it makes all the difference in the world. All the difference in the world that God's presence makes in us. And so we go and try to work with these children. I know they're bad than Jesse James. Their mamas was bad. Their daddies was bad. Their granddad, everybody been bad. But when they encounter somebody who knows the Lord, the Holy Spirit can even rest their bad temperament. And they can see somebody cares about me. Somebody cares what happens to me. Can I get a witness? I, I'm going to testify this morning. I don't mean to embarrass you. My good friend Jason G is in the uh, audience this morning. And Jason G. probably got as much love in his heart. He got as much love in his heart as anybody I've ever known for young people, particularly young men, because he sees his coaching as a ministry. And during his tenure here in Charleston, University of Charleston basketball team, it was feared by the rest of the Western Conference, not so much because they had the best players, but they played with a fire and an energy. They played like it was life and death. Every single possession, people didn't want to play against them. And he had one of the best players I've ever seen, a little old small fella who scored all kind of points. And Jason committed the cardinal sin. He let him break Keith's record. <laughs> He's supposed to set him out. Well, let me, let me wrap this thing up. This young man had all kind of trouble in his life. I testified about him on this past Wednesday night. 
of a young man who's kind of been kicked to the curb. But people don't know, since Jason left her, went to St. Bonaventure, then came back to Cleveland State, he still kept in contact with this young man, encouraged this young man, leaving me messages on my cell phone. I need you to talk to him. I need you to help him. He needs help. When nobody else would help him, Jason hung right in there with him. Now, I don't know if you read the newspaper this past week or not, but this young man got a huge settlement, and rightfully so, justifiably so, because of the injustice that was inflicted upon him. Now, I don't know where he would be without Jason G., is what I'm trying to tell you. Can you help me, preacher? Where would he be without Jason G.? Because one coach continued to pour into his life through him, through me, through other people say, no, I can't throw him away now because his eligibility is over. I'm responsible for helping him all the way through. That's the power of God I'm trying to tell you. And we underestimate God's power in our lives. Well, I ain't through, but I'm going to quit. <laughs> I'm going to quit right here. I'm, I'm out of my time. I thank you for yours. The best is yet to come. God is not lost in his power. He still does great things. All we got to do is believe him and trust him and avail ourselves to him and take what have we got and say, Lord, it's yours. I'm yours. Use me for your glory. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for an opportunity one more time.